What's that? The fuzzy white. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So uh, last time we left off, uh, we were doing some templating and passing data to templates, and we saw all that up here. And, uh, and then we've already talked about cross-site scripting and servers. And, um, and then, you know, you had that challenge and solution. You guys have gotten, like, no homework for, like, three weeks because I've been sick. We'll change that today. Get you back into the game. <laughs> and then we did the Linux server setup, and uh, we looked at ServMux. And we were uh, looking at uh, HTTP request response, right, where we saw this image here. And we were talking about, you know, the request line versus the response line or status line and headers and content. And, uh, and then we, we looked at how we could set the response header. So here we were setting the response header, content type, text, HTML, and then writing out some text, right? So we saw how we could set headers. And, uh, and then we were looking at the different things that we could grab with the URL. And so we saw things like this here, where it's uh, getting request URL path. So we explored that last week. Right, we explored all this code right here last week, just grabbing things from the URL. So we're going to build on that, and we're going to start learning about passing data. And so the first thing we're going to see is this file right here. And so let's watch it run, and then we'll look at the code. Or we'll look at the code briefly, and then watch it run and look at the code more deeply. But here, we're uh, doing a request URL query get key. The key is Q. And then we're writing to our response, do my search, plus, and then val. And val is when we ask for request URL query, get, we're saying get, you know, the queue, the value associated with queue, and then print that value right here. So it's going to write that back. And listens and serves on 8080. So uh, notice how this is set up. HTTP listen and serve, right, 8080. And then we have HTTP handle func. And so at this route, it runs this function. There we go. All the way to there. This is an anonymous function. Go supports them. Let's give you a second to kind of take that in. And uh, I'll bring up my terminal. And I have no idea where I'm at. And uh, go workspace and then source GitHub goes to 11 and go. Is it going web? There we go. And then I am wanting um, 3101. That was a lot of typing. Tap button gets rid of Do my search. So I can append to this <clears throat> what I append to add variables. Question mark? You are so right. Get my search, dog. Mm -hmm. You were just waiting <laughs> to make that joke, weren't you? It just came out naturally. <laughs> so that's kind of interesting. Just dog. So let's look at uh, how that code works. How can we learn about, uh, this is kind of like the main piece right there, right? How do we learn about that? Where do we go? What do we do? Somebody tell me what to do. I would go to the request documentation. Okay, go to request. And so request is HTTP request, right? So I go to GoDoc, and uh, I'm guessing it's going to be net HTTP, and uh, request. So there it is. And uh, we have request URL query. So here's URL. So we could go look at it's from package U. It's a pointer to a URL. It's from package URL. We can look at package URL, net URL. And inside package URL, we have a type URL. We could also have just gotten there by clicking the type. Now we're going to be right at type URL, pound URL. The pound sign, right, if we look at the HTML in that, inspect. So that pound sign right here, URL, is ID URL. And so when you have an ID 
URL, right, you can access that with pound and go to that ID. And so that's what takes me to this right there. And so inside the URL, I have a, I'm looking for a query. URL struct. Hmm? There's a method though. Nothing there, right? So let's look down. Now I have pointers to URLs. And so this is a query, a method. And there's the receiver. It's a pointer <coughs> to a URL. And so that will give me back values. Query parses raw query and returns the corresponding values. Parses raw query. So that's raw query. Encoded query values without the question mark. So query parses raw query and returns the corresponding values. What are the values? So here, query, and then the values are type values, map, string, string. And attached to values, we have add, delete, encode, get. So another method, get. And get takes a key and gives back a string. <clears throat> so we ran get, and we gave it a key, and it gave back a Q. And so we did that. We got our value dog and put it here. So <coughs> is the Q just like a placeholder? or The Q is the name that in the URL. In the URL, we do put a Q equals. Q equals dog. And what's after Q? R. So I've got a little bit to add in. R equals cat. Nothing, right? Because we haven't asked for R. However, if I do this. Start. Oh, you're doing that. Yeah, what's up? I've got a little bit to add to this. Uh, we've worked with maps in Go. And you remember the map needed a keyword in order to store data so you could request that data back. This is very similar here, uh, here where we're saying key is equal to the value we want to send. So when we want to get the data back out, we have to ask for that key. Yeah, it's a map. It's a map. So key values. And we use get to get it. We pass in the key and get back the value. And so when the when request <coughs> URL. Query. Right, gets us the query string and gives us back the values. Cool? So that's just the first step. Anybody have questions about it? How many people feel comfortable with this? How many people, eh? All right. So one of the things you know that hopefully you got over the last couple of weeks is just like here's our server, port 8080, default serve mux. We looked at creating our own custom serve mux, right? We're using default serve mux, which means that we could do things like HTTP handle func. So if we go and we look at GoDoc <coughs> and net HTTP <coughs> and index. So uh, when it's nil, we use default serve mux. And we have HTTP handle func right here. Handle func takes a pattern and a handler func, a handler func. So it's uh, this is the variable name handler, and it's a function with this signature. So here's our pattern, and then here's our function with that signature. That's what's going to run when you go here, right? This function is going to run, and what's the code that's going to run? That code, you know. So hopefully that is more. And now all we're doing is starting to use, hey, here's the request, right? The HP request. And when we look at HP request, it 
Type request, it has a URL. Cool, HTTP request has a URL. And when we look at URL, right, one of the things is query. Cool, query gives us back our query stuff. And one of the things we could do when we get our query stuff is we get values and we could get those values. And values is a map. So we're getting those values. It's parsed our query, put everything into a map. And the way this works, and this is just the web, is these are our, our key values. And put all that into a map. Q is equal to dog, R is equal to cat. If you look at any website, you're going to see those. <clears throat> what should I look for? Summer's coming. Everything after this is the query string. That's what it's called, the query string. Here URL is equal to all this stuff. Up to field keywords, that ampersand sign exits it. What does? The ampersand Oh, right there. Yeah, there's another one. So here's another, another variable set to this value. <clears throat> I didn't see that, thanks. All right, so how do we get values? That's getting values from a URL. So as you build a URL in your web page, you could just add to that URL a question mark and variables, like in your HTML. And like old school days on the web, people would, you know, just like, let me just stick a bunch of variables up in the URL. You click a link, you're taking these variables with you when you go to the next page, and then I'll grab those and I'll know things about you. And they're still sticking variables up in the URL. <clears throat> your limit is three, I think the URL field is limited to like 3,000 characters max, which is more than enough for most purposes, but you can't just get everything up there. Yeah, it's not good if you want to send war and peace. <coughs> Doesn't fit. So the next deal is uh, getting things from a form. So here we have IO write string. What is write string? Go doc, go, that's a different one. I'm not going to say that when I start typing. Go uh, doc IO and write string. Write string. There we go, right here. So write string takes a writer and a string. Gives us back int and error. It writes something to a writer. And uh, what's it write? It writes the string. All right, so here, response is a writer. Has the right method. So it implements the right interface, makes it a writer. How many people, when I say that, you're following me? How many people, when I say that, you're like, Aah. So uh, we have also here, write string takes a writer, and a writer is also at I.O., and a writer is an interface. Interfaces are implicitly implemented in Go. Anything that has this functionality, so it's kind of like uh, in Java, they also call it abstract classes. Is that right? Right, that's another way you could do it in Java. And then they even have interfaces in Java, which are like, everything is abstract, I think. Is that right in Java? Everything's abstract, it's an interface. But then you have to say <laughs> implements in Java to hell with Java, right? Implicitly implemented in Go. If you have the right method, you implicitly implement this interface. So we are passing in response. And a response writer is from HTTP, so go doc, net HTTP, and look at response writer. And response writer has the right method. Since it has the right method, it implicitly implements the writer interface. Since it implements the writer interface, IO write string is asking for a writer, so we give it a writer. We're writing to our response, and the thing we're writing is this string. That is a raw string li literal between backticks. Raw string literal. So it's just a string, and it's raw, meaning keep the spaces, keep the formatting. right? And I could use double quotes in there because I'm using backticks for the string. So there we've got our string that's going to be written. And what's being written? What is that? It's a form. It's basic HTML. So it's a form, and we've got an input, and it's going to take text, and we've got to submit. 
and the name is Q. So name is naming the variable. Sometimes you'll see, you'll often see this, where you have name Q, ID Q. It's like, huh? Why do you need them both? Name is naming the variable. ID is how I'd access that through JavaScript or through CSS. Right? I want to do, I want to target that through CSS or through JavaScript. I target the ID. But name is a uh, name in the variable. So all we need is name. So we're writing that. So let's take a look at it. Control C, change directories. How many like people like this course better when I'm not sick? <laughs> <laughs> I feel a little bit like my mojo has come back. Like, all right, cool. Start teach you guys some stuff again. Sweet! I wrote out my little form. Barely see it on the projector. See it? If I inspect that, whoa, that's not what I sent over. What did I send over? Form, input, input, form. And this is what I got. I sent over form, input, input, form. But, it ought, it, but Chrome said, all right, you idiot. I'll put in the rest. <coughs> HTML head, body, there you go. And if I look at the network on that, it asks for localhost, right? That request, and then also fav icon. And a content type is text, HTML, car set, UTF-8. That's the content type. And up here, I said content type, header set, text HTML, car set, UTF-8. What if that wasn't there? What do you think is going to happen when I refresh this page? What are we going to see? Download it. Huh? Download the file? Download it? Maybe. Who knows? I'll put some money on that one. Download the file. What else might happen? You would get a... Uh... Eh, I'll put a little bit of money on that one, not a whole lot. Maybe. Maybe get a fave icon there. What else might happen? I commented out. I commented out. Set content type text HTML. I commented that out. Plain text? Plain text, maybe, which means we'll just see plain text up here. I'll put a lot of money on that one. And I don't have total confidence where who how I'm going to win. This would be, actually be like a really cool casino game. Because I bet you could get statistics on what people know and what they don't know. And then you could just ask audiences questions. And people would be like, here's the question. How far is the earth from the sun? And there would be like eight answers. You know, 630,000 miles, 63 million miles, 93 million miles, 93 billion miles. Right? And then people could just bet. Like no phones. So you'd have it like a phone dead zone. I bet that could be a money maker for a casino. Who knows the answer to, <laughs> to how far the world is from the sun? One light year. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, I think it's 93 million. I was at a playground yesterday and they had these things kids could play with and it showed how far the different planets were from the sun. It's kind of cool. All right, let's see what happens. Oh, no fave icon there, but all we saw is text because now content type is text plain. Son of a gun. Let's put that on. And I got to restart it. So, so now we got default, that. Right? Huh? Text plain is the, the default. If Go can detect that it's plain text, if Go is seeing some like some file type that it's never heard of before, <coughs> it'll, start, it'll use the uh, download file type, uh, multi part file or something. I yeah, I think that's a Go right? default, Go server. And then if but, I remember this, correctly... This was text, though, so it was able to figure out. It says text plain. If yeah. I remember correctly, had our text begun with HTML, it would have known that yeah, it should if, if, if it starts off with the doc type HTML, yeah, you can figure out it's HTML automatically. But we're starting a form, not a doc type. Smoke and Joe. I have no idea why I wrote that. <laughs> what? Smoke and Joe went in and nothing came out. I entered Smoke and Joe. Smoke and Fred. What? Nothing happened. Hey, cool. Smoke and Joe, Smoke and Fred. 
How come there are these with nothing? You might be getting the return carriage. Uh, I'll put a little bit of money on that one. So, uh, before, before you entered Spoken Joe, you already had those two uh, value things, so there's something going on uh, when you uh, load the page. Oh. <laughs> So you're what is faveicon.ico? What's the guy's name? Alex. What is faveicon.ico, Alex? So it's asking for that, and it's not getting anything back. Because if we look at our code, we have listen and serve on 8080, default serve mux, HTTP handle func, which takes a route, and a, a handler, which is a function with this signature. <laughs> and then that function is uh, this code right here. So that's the code that runs when we go to forward slash. And then we get to forward slash and we have we say, hey, key is just the letter Q. It's just a variable. It's a string. Request form value key. Q. Remember Q here is that variable name. So we're requesting form value. That's new. Request form value. Right? That line right there. Request form value. Because before we were doing request URL query get. Now we're doing request form value. Well, if I was going to name a function to get the values from a form, I think form value might be a good name. And if we go and we look at that request, and request, and then request uh, form value. <coughs> Oh no, I'm going to do it like this. Request form value right here. So when you have a pointer to a request, you have form value. And what is form value? It takes a key and it gives you a string. So it's form value returns the first value for the name component of the query. Post and put body parameters take precedence over URL que query string values. Holy cow, we could even do this for URLs. And if we have a conflict between keys, it's going to give me the key Q from the form as opposed to the key Q from the URL. So in this first page right here, I could have even just used request request form value right there, right? So because that's what that documentation just told me. It's post, put body parameters, URL. Form value calls the parse multi-form, blah blah blah. Why is it for both post form values and URL query? Anybody know the answer to that question? Why is it both post form values and URL query? Is it because um, is it I love it. I love the gambling. I love the speculating. Keep going. Hang on. What was the question? Why is it both post for form values and why does request form value also allow you to get the URL? Why does, you know, request form value give you also the URL? That must mean if it's giving me the URL and this is form value that the form can be submitted to send the results through the URL. And so when you have forms, you could say, hey, Use post as the method or get. And you could use either of those. And if you use post, it sends it kind of in the background with the body, right? So the client is sending, making a request to the server. And that has, uh, and when we look at that image. So, so it putting it in the body is, the post system is also why when you go to like a website where you're ordering something, when you hit refresh, it asks you, hey, are you sure that you want to resend the data? It's, 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 it, the, the, your request there has the data, has your whatever financial information or login information or whatever in the body there, even if it's not visible in the URL. So there's the HP request. It also can send content, the body. And when you do the form, it's going kind of in the content, the body. When you do, when you so that's a method post. When you do method get, get sends it through the URL. The form values through the URL. You want to see it in action? No, we don't want to see it in action. 
You know how I remember this? How many letters are in form? Four. How many letters are in post? Four. So go with the form background. That's, that's method post. How many letters are in URL? Three. How many letters are in git? Three. So git sends it through the URL. Little mnemonic device. So uh, here, close, 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 this one, that one. What's our method? There's post. All right. Wait, what do I type there instead of post for URL? Get. Confirm it. There it is. All right. So now let's restart our server. I think I did. Yeah, I think I did. Oh, you're right. I gotta, I gotta refresh that. Thank you. And you know what? Because I was using request form value, so it grabs it from. I send it through the form or I send it through the URL, request form value grabs it. Because I'm asking for the form value, and a form value can send it through the background or it can send it through the URL. So it gets URL query parameters or it gets submitted ones. So now you're starting to get the pieces to build a form, have somebody submit data, and access that data. You build a form, right? Here's a form, basic form. And all you do is what's your input type? Determine your input type. How do you learn what the different input types are? You go to the documentation. MDN is always where you want to go. Right? So form HTML MDN. And uh, wow, this is really crappy resolution. Usually there's a whole selection over here on the left. <coughs> and on the right, there's usually a link to stuff. Chrome may have the best developer tools, but uh, Firefox has got the best website for teaching you what every option for HTML is. Yeah, <laughs> MDN is the go-to source for documentation. So here you can see, uh, I was just scrolling through it, examples are the different inputs. So there's the form, and I was just looking to see if it had information about input. So I'd go to MDN input, and uh, here's input, and so with input I could scroll down. And, uh, and we were using input, text. yeah, just looking, where is it? Input text. Well, look at all these different inputs we have. Checkbox, button, email, hidden, image, month, number, password, radio button, range, search, submit, telephone, time, URL, week. Interesting, right? So those are that's a form. It's a form with input types, and then just give them a name, name that variable, and then use request form value and pull those variables out and use them programmatically. Eventually, stick them into a database, or take those variables and do some calculations and so show some result. Oh, you wanted to calculate convert yards to meters, meters to yards. Got those? Got your input? Did the math, showed you the result, right? Coded that up. It's just basic programming. And Todd, you forgot a pretty common thing that we learned just these past what two What did weeks. I forget? Handle fave icon. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I don't have that in there. How would I type it in? Where did I type it in? You're not using your box, so you'd have to handle that. <laughs> Is there something here that I'd use? Probably. Which one of these? Second one. And uh, maybe I could go to the documentation and search in that HTTP, which is right here. And I'll search for a fave icon. 
We've got one patterns name fixed, uh, rooted past like fav icon ico. You might remember that one. There's like a no. Uh, what was the response that we gave for fav icon ico? So we could do that. And uh, HP not found handler, right? Means a route and a handler. Does that look right? Does that look right? Handle handles and handler. So handle yeah. takes a handler, handle funk takes a funk. So now if I run this, and uh, we're going now back through the URL. And uh, smoke and horse. I have no idea what's up with the smoking stuff. I was going to say, you keep doing that. And at some point in time, you're just going to make a smoking commercial. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to convince you all to start smoking. <laughs> so no fave icon. That's kind of cool. Thanks, Alan. And more importantly, we're not getting extra $40. Yeah. I like it. We'll leave it in. I don't know. Or does it make things more confusing? It's worth talking about. All right. So I don't know. Uh, maybe we already covered what some of these files do. So here we have method get. Right? Same deal as before. But uh, we're getting it from the URL. So we already saw that. And then here we have post and we're doing a checkbox. So you can run that and kind of see what you get back with a checkbox or I'll run it. <laughs> On. What about nothing? Nothing. So it gives me on when it's checked and nothing when it's not. Checkbox Q. I think checkbox has a value you could set, doesn't it? Yeah. To say instead of on. Yeah, it's, it's literally value. The value equals And then you can just do whatever. <coughs> checkbox, you must use the value attribute to find the value submitted by this term. Use the checked attribute to indicate whether the item is checked. You can also use indeterminate, <laughs> so value. <laughs> to go with the stupid theme. I have some good news, by the way. So uh, uh, my in-laws, actually my mom, my parents' house, and then my mother-in-law's house. I showed you guys that radon site, talked to you about radon a little bit. Yes? No? Mm -hmm. No? You know what? You probably didn't do that this time. So uh, there's, uh, this, this is a website I built. And uh, with my cousin, um, he's a contractor. So like we got relatives back in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where they have radon. And then we went to Portland, and they have radon up there. So I started wondering, we got radon in Fresno. I tested my house, and it is like you know higher levels. And I've got kids, and so the EPA says if it's above four picocuries per liter, you need to get rid of it. It's the second leading cause of lung cancer in America. Twenty thousand people die each year in America, or two hundred thousand, I forget which. Uh, radon lung cancer deaths. It's a uh, fifteen to twenty-two thousand a year die from radon, cause lung cancer deaths. So we nobody in town. There's nobody who puts these in. Nobody knows how to do it. The nearest company is like three hours away. So I figured out how to do it. Just read up on it. We did a DIY do-it-yourself project. And I put one system in my house. Brought the levels down. And then my cousin and I were like, you know, this would be kind of a cool thing. We should maybe look into doing this. Help people out. And uh, so he's going through the certification process. You got to go through all this training and take tests and all that crap.
But uh, we just put systems in at my mom's house and my mother, my parents' house and my mother-in-law's house. My mother-in-law had 9.9 high, but then her levels came down to like 1.4. And uh, my mom had like 6.7. Her levels came down to like 1.3. It was kind of cool. We just did that Thursday and Friday, put those two systems in. <laughs> the news came out and interviewed us. There's going to be some news report. Hopefully we'll get our certification soon, so start making money off that. But good to know about. You should know about radon. And uh, if you want to have your home tested, you could buy those testing machines either on our website, right here, test your home today, or you could uh, buy them on Amazon, same machines. So you get just 130 bucks and read the instructions, test your house. And, uh, and if you got an issue, you could hit me up and I'll tell you how to DIY it yourself. <clears throat> Were we learning something? Oh, we did that. All right. Content type, you know, key, request form value, print the value. So we're printed out. We have the response header and then write string to write out our form and then show the value if the value is there. Adds it up. What's that tell you that I'm always able to print that value? Because value is coming from request form value. And request form value, right, uh, takes a key and gives back a, a string. And that key is right here, our form key. What's that look like? Map access, right? We're accessing a value in a map by index or key, key value, not index, by key. It's actually called key. And, uh, and what's that tell you that I'm always able to use val here? What if I looked up something, some value? I mean, sometimes I look that up and that doesn't exist. There's, has, the form hasn't been submitted when I first load that page. How come that doesn't break? I'm asking for a value that doesn't exist. It seems like Go statically typed, really tightly statically typed, right? You got to have all your ducks in a row. It seems like Go would be like, there's nothing there. How come that's not breaking? Well, uh, is there a... If you have nothing in a map, it just returns nothing. Returns a zero value. So if you don't have anything in the value, and value is a map, then it should return no value. An attempt to fetch a map value with a key that is not present in the map will return the zero value for the type of the entries in the map. So the type is a string, the zero value of a string is an empty string. So right here, what we're printing out is an empty string. Cool. All right, so method post. This is different. Something changed here. What changed? What's different about our form? <clears throat> yeah, we got ink type. Huh? What's ink type stand for? Blue ink, red ink, black ink? Encoding. Encoding type. And the encoding type is multi-part form data. Interesting. Let's read about that. MDM form. Form, ink, type. When the value of the method attribute is post, ink type is the MIME type of content that is used to submit the form to the server. The MIME type of content that is used to submit the form to the server. Possible values are application, x, www, form, URL encoded, the default value if the attribute is not specified. Who knew? Multi-part form data, the value used for an input element with the type attribute set to file. Oh, ink type, multi-part form data, the value used for input, input where this type is set to file. We're going to be able to upload a file. Or there's ink type text plane. This is a little bit interesting. What's that mean? Anybody know that? And I'm, I'm asking that not as like a 
rhetorical Socratic teaching method. I'm asking that like, I don't know what the hell that is. <coughs> I'm not sure what the text plane there is for, but the mime type is the same as the con is the same thing that you're sticking into the value for content type. Where you got text plane, text HTML, image JPEG, image PNG. So those are all mime types. So ENC type just take it takes in a mime type, but it only allows certain mime types. Whenever I hear mime type, I think this. <laughs> Which mime type? But mime, also mime type, media type, <laughs> is a two-part identifier for file formats and format contents transmitted on the internet. <laughs> two-part identifier for file formats and format contents transmitted on the internet. A media type is composed of type, a subtype, and optional parameters. As an example, an HTML file might be designed text HTML car set UTF-8. Hmm, interesting. Right? That's what we use for uh, this right here, content type, text, HTML, car set, UTF-8. So that's the mime type of an HTML file. HTML file. In this example, text is the type, HTML is the subtype, and car set, UTF-8 is an optional parameter indicating the character encoding. What's UTF-8? Who knows UTF-8? Raise your hand. Raise your hand, you know UTF-8. Are you kidding me? This question is called the truth will save you. If you do not know UTF-8, I won't call on you. Raise your hand if you do not know UTF-8, and I will not call on you. Raise your hand if you don't know it. You don't know UTF-8. Raise your hand. Okay. Blue hat, what's UTF-8? Too long. Red scarf. What's red? UTF-8. I think it's a really good Yeah. UTF-8. I don't know the exact, actually, definition. I know it's character encoding, but what does UTF stand for? Universal Text Format. <laughs> does it have a... Does it have an acronym quality to it? Universal text format. I have no idea what UTF stands for, but that would be my guess. So UTF-8 is the most popular coding scheme in the world. Unicode text format. Yeah. Unicode text format. Do you see that? Universal coded character. No, the top. Top, top line, very far right, says Unicode, I'm guessing. Oh, Unicode text format. Where? Right here? Transformation format, 8-bit. Universal transformation format. Who knew? But it's the most popular coding scheme. And the first part of it is uh, ASCII. And it's a four. it's a four-byte coding scheme. So it could encapsulate all the characters in all the languages the world over, plus room to grow. And there's a really awesome video. Yeah? UTF can do all characters. ASCII cannot. That was the problem. Mm -hmm. yep. So yeah, C++ is stuck with this D, but uh, Go and a few other languages like Java use UTF-8 for their programming, <coughs> which makes Go actually really popular in uh, Asian countries because they can use their own characters for variable names. Hello, Shang Shou Shai. I don't know if that's politically correct. I might have just gone over the line. <laughs> just, just the other day, I went. I actually went to Golang-JP.org instead. Of Instead, it was all Japanese. Oh, was it? Cool. Yeah. Right? But that's uh, right there. There's uh, UTF-8. So. And uh, we could do this. And we can see the individual bytes. And we're just going to make it H. H space. And so here's H72, capital H. And if we look at ASCII, ASCII is the first part of UTF-8. It's an old text encoding scheme. And capital H is 72. 
decimal, right? Yep. And so there is uh, 72 for H. And then we have a space, which is 32. 32 is a space. And then we have uh, 228, 184, 150, which I guess is that. And we have 231, 149, 140, which is that. And that is the symbol in some language for world. I'm guessing it's Chinese. Go is huge in China. I got a message from yesterday on China. Thank you so much. Your Go videos are helping me. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, it's cool. Some girl in China on YouTube It's like, thanks for this video. It totally helped. I don't know if you remember because it was a whole year ago, but I was introduced to Go through Cody Bell because some of the top coders on there use Go and they're from China. Yeah. So it's a, a UTF-8 is a four-byte coding scheme. So what it basically means is every everything in computers numbers. This number means this character. This number means this character. So UTF-8 is just one particular mapping <coughs> of characters of numbers to characters. And here's a really great video which I'm going to put onto our sy syllabus. It's a fun video. It is. And uh, actually, I'll put it in as an assignment. So where's our homework list? It's almost worth it, actually. It is totally worth it, especially since none of y'all knew. That one is a good video. Oh, I love them. Yeah. I think it's great. They'll walk it's you through history that you didn't even know mm -hmm. in computers. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, this one is basically how you get way it works written on a napkin in a restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. To be fair, napkins and other paper in restaurants. I mean, I, I, I've yeah. sat in the bucket with the box, uh, uh, with the pizza box, just with the pen, uh, pen, just writing things out. Yeah. <clears throat> napkins are bigger than pieces of paper sometimes. Yeah. All right. So we left off on uh, ink type <laughs> multipart form data. So you got to add that if you're going to upload a file, right? So we're going to upload a file. We have to add that to our form. <coughs> so now we could, uh, you know, we have uh, listen serve 88, default serve much, handle func, and then a function, and then key, Q, and request form file. Before we were saying request what? Form what? What was the value function form before? Value. Form value. Now we're saying form file, right? So go doc net HTTP, that's the request, index, request. And uh, request had, let me go back to that, form value, and then here's form file, right? <laughs> so when we ask for a form file, ooh, we get some pretty big stuff back. We get back multipart file, a pointer to a multipart file header, and an error. Uh. All right, so we have... Uh, and it's kind of interesting, it's multi-part. Like there's a whole package called multi-part. Implements my multi-part parsing. So that might mean the file's coming in in different parts. It has to do with email. Emails, when you send someone an email, it sends an HTML part, a, t a plain text part if their web browser doesn't support HTML, and then whatever attachments you've got. So it's a multi-part file. It's coming in in different packets? Is that what it means? Nope, it's, it's all one package. It's just got multiple parts to it. HTML part, text part, attachment part. Oh, okay. Part. So, this, so your, your files will probably only have one part, but the, uh, it, the way it's encoded, is it's still a multi-part file. It just only has one part in it. Did you spend like 100 hours over the summer working with email? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and multi-part files? Okay. Yes, yes. You still remember my Twitter thing? That yeah, that was sweet. To tweet? That was awesome. So request form file, we give it the key, and then we get a file, a header, and an error. And then we're going to just print the file, the header, the error, and content type, text, HTML, and, uh, and we're writing out. So we're just printing this to uh, standard out, right? And we're not doing anything with file other than right there, or with header other than right there, or with error other than right there. Let's just print them out and see what happens. <clears throat> so that's number five. I gotta create a file to upload.
I don't know, maybe I should say something more interesting. What was I thinking of the other day? I was thinking of, um, Rumi, you guys ever read any of the poetry by Rumi? He's got cool poems. There we go. All right. <clears throat> Are we ready to run this? Talked about it long enough. And choose a file. Crap. Oh, Mongo, I gotta navigate all the way there. Go workspace, source, GitHub, goes to 11. Uh, go, go lane web. Thank you. And it's like way down here, passing data in five. Submit. Let's see what it printed out. So we asked for the file, the header, and the error. So this looks like a pointer to an address where the file is. This looks like <clears throat> the address is oh, uh, it, a struct. Did it say an error? So um, the error is the very bottom, the nil mm -hmm. is the error. So that struct goes all the way down to the very end. All the way there? Yeah. And there's my error. There we go. So that, uh, that, that middle part is the header. So the reason why it only puts an address to the first item is because multi-part file is an interface, not a struct. So it doesn't actually know what's inside it. It's just giving you the interface, which it may still be downloading the file at the point where, you, where it gives you that file. And then when you call to read it, it waits until it finishes downloading some more. Oh, hang on. So what's highlighted right now is just the header? Just the header. Now is that uh, the text in the uh, ASCII code? That so, 66. So the multi part header. <laughs> 66 is B. That's the first letter. B. E. Lowercase e would be 101. 101. So it looks like it. 32 is a space. Makes you wonder now what's inside that header. It's got the entire <coughs> contents of the file too. Kind of interesting. Anyhow, just exploring, experimental, nothing to. Let's look at the next example. I think I probably build on it. Or let me rephrase it. I think Caleb probably built upon it. <laughs> Listen to serve 8080, handle funk. <clears throat> Request form file, give me the file, who cares about the header, here's the error. The file, defer file close, I owe you re util read all file, sweet, I, I owe utility, read it all, read this file, give me back some bull bite slice, and throw away the error, bad coding, but just an example to illustrate one concept, not a full-fledged production code. Also, full -fledged. bad coding here, what if someone uploads a multi-gigabyte file? Read off. Oh, I think that gets taken care of in the next one. Good point. Take that BS and turn it into a string. It's starting to sound like politics. And then set the header. And then write the form. And uh, I just printed that BS string to uh, the standard out when we get it. Let's look and see what happens. <laughs> Am I at 9,000? Oh, I blew up. All right, where did I blow up? No, let's just look at the code. 
panic serving request content type isn't multi-part form data request content type what line is that doesn't tell me tells me the message over and over again Made you ran into the message over and over again. 13? That's the time. Down like four lines. There. Yeah. Main.go 15. There's my panic. Because when you first go to the website, you're not uploading any files. You have so no form variable files error. Giving you back an error. You have no variable error. You talk to the way. I got an error. error two lines up. I don't have like, a header. Oh, there's that. It's the header I was thinking about. Yeah. Key, so have, request I mean, form file, so key. It's, yeah, it's coming in as an error because first time he goes to the web page, he's not uploading any file. So it's not, yeah. so form file Q is <clears> nothing. <throat> so it's getting back an error. And he's panicking on error instead of yeah. serving web page so you can actually get around to uploading the file. How do I fix it? Don't panic. What do you think? Don't panic. It's always a good first step. <laughs> so only do the uh, file stuff if panic is equal to nil. Only do the file stuff if panic is equal so to nil. Move line 17 through 21 into the uh, if statement and change it to if error is equal to nil. 17 through 21. You can say set error is equal to nil. Error, is equal. error equals nil. So if there's no error, we can read from the file, do stuff with it. If there is an error, it will skip the if statement, but we're not using the file in the rest of the code there. Oh, that's wacky. That's not good coding, is it? Better than <laughs> so usually you'd have a separate URL for post requests compared to get requests. Because when you first go to the web page, it's a get request to get the web page. And then when you're submitting a file, it's posting. But uh, in this case, it's more complicated just to separate it out between get and post. So this works. I say we do it with action. I think that'd be cleaner. No? Yeah. You can do it that way? Post, ink type. Also, one thing to note here, you do not want your web server to panic. You'll usually want to send an error message both to, to some log files so that you can see what happened and some error message back to the client so that they can see that something went wrong and then keep your server running so you don't have your website down. Um. What should I call it? Columns. Hmm? Columns. And a submission. Let's call it HS. This is why Lux is useful. Everything on you get in post. You do a router to make it even easier. Yeah. It makes for a long list of URLs, but yeah. I usually just have a separate file of routes that go and just just for that part. Mm -hmm. Crap, no, I just got another problem. No, because I want to get that. Now you can panic on there or um, something. All right, <clears throat> now when you uh, first go here, you'll get the form. 
So we set that, and then we write out the form. And the form has action. So if we go look at forms, and look for action. The URI of a program that processes the form information, the value can be overridden with this and this and this. And we can look at examples down below. <coughs> and so uh, here action is set to nothing. But I've set action, and I'm not sure this will work, just forward slash HS. Hopefully that will send it back here. So when we go to HS, it will uh, do all this. And then we should probably, once we're here, do an HP redirect and uh, do the response. Let's redirect take response. And uh, request and URL. URL encode. It's weird, it takes the request. That'd be it. In the code 300 or 302 or something. Okay. Oh, in the code. So the different codes for um, responses are GoDoc, <laughs> net HTTP, and they're either in variables or constants. There we go. Okay. And we've seen these before. So uh, what we're going to do 302 redirect. 302 is status found. I don't quite understand status found. Why is that? Why is it status found and that's a redirect? Why not? Oh, I found a different resource for you. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So I prefer to use see other. See other? What is that? 303. Oh, see other. Really? So that makes more sense. But 302 is pretty much common practice, right? So it's, it's kind of odd. So 302 originally had a particular meaning in the HTTP spec that no one followed. So every web server was using it as meaning a different something. So eventually the HP tech guys basically said, you know what, don't, don't bother. 302 is deprecated. Here's 303, which means what 302 was supposed to mean. And here's 307, which means what everyone's acting like 302 means. Yeah, so we should use 307 so, or 303. So, so, uh, so 303 basically means we process the form. Now go here for your actual web for a web page. 307 means we're not doing anything here. If you sent us a form, send it over here too. Oops, I was using the wrong code. <laughs> That's awesome, dude. Where'd you learn that? You just look, read it. I was it? looking up the various uh, You're looking up the codes. That's cool. So, I love so your three, 302 is, depre is technically deprecated, but everyone uses it as if it's identical to 307. All right, so far so good. So far so good. So far so good. Hey, look at that. That's what, that's where it's like web programming, you get a little endorphin, adrenaline, like the good feeling that comes from something working. You haven't read Rumi, you got to read Rumi. And uh, <clears throat> there's another really good one, uh, Ryokan, um, Moonlight Poem, Moonlight Window Poem. So Ryokan was a monk in Japan who was a... Uh, you know, he's just a monk, and um, he write poetry. That's not that. It's not on this page, I guess. Oh, so here's his poem. His house got robbed, and he wrote that poem. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, the guy took everything, but the moon's still here. Pretty cool. He also has this other one, which is cool. Um, that's weird. <laughs> 
Just sweet. <laughs> Can you read it? Barely. <laughs> the first day of autumn, returning from my alms round, I set down my bowl by the temple to go play with the children. Last year, a foolish monk. This year, no change. <laughs> it's easier to read on the back one than it is uh, on the front one. The back projector is better, better contrast. We'll keep that up in case we need another poem. <laughs> <coughs> did, I, did I share this with you guys? Have I shared this? <coughs> no? So uh, in addition to economic and business, I took about 10 years of my life, and I was just like, I really always wanted to be an author. I just wrote a crap load of books. I wrote like 45 novels. 20 of them are published. I make about 3 to $5 a month. <laughs> Not very popular. But like, you know, some of the reviews are pretty good, and some of them aren't so good. You know, four stars from eight customers. <coughs> All across the board, though. <clears throat> you can check them out. They're kind of wacky, though. I mean, just like those those poems, Rio Khan and Rumi, are sort of wacky, but in a really cool way. That's how my books are. Like, if you look at like, uh, sorry, digression. Then I'll stop. If you look at like this one here, this one book is like, um, it's a uh, lay me down. So lay me down was like just about existentialism and. And uh, where's the description? No reviews. Nobody re has read it. <laughs> where's the description of the book? <laughs> Maybe that's why. Whatever. But the, the back part of that book, I wish I could see the back part. That's so weird. About the author, product details. <laughs> Anyhow, the description of the book's kind of, you know, it's disjointed and fragmented. It's like different. All right, there's 01. Back to code. Here's 02. We're going to have the same issue here. Nope. No? Did I fix it? If request method equals post, sweet. I like that. That totally works. That's an even better solution. And uh, and then header, content type, text HTML, form. So I guess that first one is just to illustrate that error. Example.txt. All right, so let's do 02. <coughs> and I want uh, this one now. Sweet. So, uh, also change from the read yeah. all to copy. That's pretty cool. Copy takes a, a reader and a writer. So it reads this and writes there. Again, multi-gigabyte files are a problem, but not, not as much here. With a read all, you're reading it all into memory. So what if you don't have enough memory? Here, you're sending it, you, it'll read like a little chunk, <coughs> and then write it, read the next chunk, write it. Which means your main limitation now is hard drive space. You still have the issue of uh, too much stuff there, but not as much. Which is why I think this has a limit reader. I was looking at something that said limit reader earlier today. Execute, first name, last name. There's no limit reader there. Where did I see limit reader? Oh, there's a whole crap load there. here. I bet you it's in here. Yeah, there it is. Limit reader. Right? So you can limit how much you read. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, we're almost out of time. We'll just go up to 
Um, here's form data. So we have a form. And uh, here's the form. It's going to be sent post. And we have a label. And it's for ID first name. So we're targeting the label to that input. And then this will be the variable name is first that we get back. And the variable name we get back will be last. And, uh, and then we'll also display that first and last on this, this uh, template. So we're going to parse that template. So now we're putting the things over on a template. And uh, template parse files. Obviously, this should be in func init if we're going to do production code. And, uh, right and it, here it works. Huh? It's, it's only parsing once here. Uh, it's not every time? Fun, yeah. Just when main calls? Yeah, it's, in, it's in main, not in the handle. Oh, OK, there we go. That's fine. Parse files, form, go HTML. Then we get our template, and, uh, and then handle func with our function, and then the code that runs. And uh, request form value first, request form value last, and then just printing out, uh, you know, first name, and then also printing out slice of bytes first name, and then also printing out the type of the first name. <coughs> this is a little bit of a different way that, to do it than you've seen me do it before, and I can show you how I did it before, just as a reminder in a second. And then execute this template to our response and pass in person, F name, last name. So uh, we're just creating a composite literal of a struct here. And that struct comes from right here, first name, last name. And so we're just passing that data in. And if error is not nil, do an error, log it, and kill uh, everything that's going on. Fatal, log fatal. So let's uh, look at this one. And this is at 07, so I need to come up two levels. How many people are like a little surprised, like, whoa, we're actually learning web programming? Is it just me? It's like, you know, we keep taking these steps. It's like, oh, I got another piece. Holy cow. Is there anybody else that's a little bit surprised? Because it's, it's not like your Ruby on Rails or your PHP where it's like, oh, of course, right? It's like just taking straight programming, you know, with a really cool standard library that's built to do this kind of stuff and code it up. It's like it makes sense when you see it, but it's not like, you know, there it's 100% abstracted way and, you know, some PHP crap or, you know, some Ruby on Rails crap. It's like, no, you're just like, you know, working with variables here. Variables coming from the form, you're getting it, you're putting it in a struct, you're sending it back, showing it. It's like, I don't know. I'm always a little surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so I printed out the type as a string. First name is James. Well, he here's James, and then slice of bytes just for fun, and type string. And I used reflect to do the type string there. You could have also done it like this, printf. And that would have printed the type. Another way to do the same thing. Let's just run it to prove it. Right there. String, string. It's weird. I think that's fave icon that's coming through. Yeah. Because there's the Maryland type of string. Oh, right there. That's it. Because I should have added this. New line. All right. So that's a... Uh, 
Faraway's through form data. We'll pick up with form file upload. I want to leave you with one more thing before you head out. And uh, that thing is um, I'm trying to figure out where to send it, send you to it. There it is. So if you want to learn more about the HTML and CSS, um, a really good video index here. And these videos, uh, I've recorded all these videos up through. I'll show you where. But here is, uh, you know, this YouTube, my, my YouTube stuff. And if you go to uh, YouTube, Todd McLeod, and then go to... Um, playlist, learn HTML and CSS, right? I haven't uploaded all the videos. I still have to edit a few of them, but it's getting pretty close. And uh, introduction to CSS, introduction to HTML, structuring documents, the different tags. It's all pretty straightforward. Headings and outlines, layout essentials. So learning how to do layout, right, with HTML and how do you create different pages. So everything from the display property, the box, uh, the box model, box sizing border box, how do you center things with margin zero auto, how do you round corners on things with border radius, and then position, which is another way. So display is one of the things we work with. Position is one of the things we work with. Floats are one of the things we work with, right? And then I'll also be adding in uh, media queries and flexbox coming pretty soon. So if you're interested in this just on your own, you could drop in and watch a couple hours of videos and, and get access to files. I have all those files up here on GitHub. Uh, goes to 11. Uh, and so this might just be another way you check it out, HTML, CSS. Right? You could go through and just run each of these files and see, like, oh, how do I start doing layout You know, to create pages? Because now you're starting to get this <laughs> thing where you could pass data and do forms and, and pretty soon we'll be putting it into data storage. Silly me, I thought this was going to be kind of easy when I kind of jump back into this game. It's like, cool, I'm going to figure this back. Six months, nine months, I'll be building sites again. Two years I've been chipping away at this. Maybe coming up on three years since 2013. January 2013, I finished my last novel. And then like my son was born in August. And somewhere right around there, I just threw myself back into coding and started picking all this up again. All right, I'll see you all on Wednesday for some more fun. How many people got your money's worth today? How many people want to refund? Don't forget to do the homework. Yeah, I'll put some homework up. Watch that video. I'll put something else up. I've got a class in okay. 10 minutes. Okay. No what do you need help with? We're just like, you know.